is the aquifer system map for the island of Hawaii. Um, there's a number of them, and this is how we manage and sp um, split up the pie, so to speak, of all the water we think is available from the groundwater perspective. And we're only talking about this red area today. And so just a little history. This is, like I said, it's been going on for over a year, September 13th, 2013. Uh, last year, the National Park Service submitted this petition requesting that that area be designated as a groundwater management area. What does that mean? Well, in groundwater management areas, the, it requires additional regulation. There is regulation right now, but the additional regulation is that water use has to be approved, in most cases, groundwater use, through groundwater use permits. And um, I'll get a little bit more into that later. Okay. The designation process itself, this is a, a little bit of a highlight because up until this point, this is the process how we've uh, been describing it over the past year. There's actually been um, slight modifications to this as we've been discussing this uh, internally. And where we are today in this process is actually right here, this point, this, this long rectangle. The commission decides whether to continue the designation process or not. Okay, if you can see from the top down, the initiation can happen by the chair or it happened by written petition by the National Park. Once we get a petition, we consult with the county, so all the major council, mayor, department of water supplies. And um, if need be, investigations are made. Now, the commission is supposed to get to this point normally in 60 days, okay, or if there's a lot of investigations, a lot of questions, a lot of issues, they can choose to extend it, okay. And what happened last year in October is that the commission decided to extend it after reading the petition to here we are today, December 2014. So this is where we're at. Okay. Now, the change really is in where do we go from here? Because what we were presenting before was that once the commission makes a decision today, there would be 90 days uh, for the commission to come out with a final decision on whether to designate or not. That has changed. So this next chart basically shows there's a gap here in the timeline. Okay, I'll just toggle up between the two. Uh, slight differences too is that there are really two findings of fact. There's a final one. We're only at the preliminary one today, okay? And that's to help with this decision, whether we continue. This gap, okay, is to allow for more time between the public hearing and also to allow if there's, you know, more investigations because we've gotten a ton of testimony over the past two weeks. And we've been, uh, that's part of your submittal and indexed and so forth. A lot of it's on the website as well for everyone in the public to review it at their desire. It's when that final findings of fact is made and we come back for another meeting uh, and make the recommendation what to do, then the commission has 90 days to make a final decision. So in, in short, there's a little bit more breathing room. It's not as imminent as we were describing earlier. So that's the difference the main difference. Okay. So just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so the area we're talking about is this, uh, the green area is the park. I think everyone local here is familiar with that. Those are the boundaries. Uh, this is the aquifer boundaries of the Keo aquifer system area. You may notice that the park extends into the <coughs> ocean and that's some of the issues that they've had and um, talked about in their petition. Now, um, this is from the petition and this kind of encapsulates, I think, what the concern is. The park, again, this green area, surrounded by all this planned development and how that may impact the park in terms of groundwater use. You can see the wells up here. In the, this is a high level, and there's wells nearby in the basal uh, area. They're concerned about the impacts to the park and what pumpage would do to the quality of the water. So. Um, the history, for those who are new here, it, this isn't something new and just started a year ago. It's actually been going on since about 2007. There's been a lot of working groups uh, uh, and effort. One initiated by the National Park back in 2007, followed by the Round Table, which was really spearheaded. Uh, I believe, um, Milton, you were still in charge at the time. Commissioner um, Paval was in charge at the time. And then there's also professionals who we um, talked about things back in 2008 as far as sustainable yields uh, because the commission staff itself, uh, through the water resource protection plan, set sustainable yields. 
So there's a lot of discussion since then. So again, it's nothing new. The outcome of all these discussions were actually three major things. There have been increased monitoring. Um, there's also been ongoing studies and also because of this petition, more of a review of the extensive completed studies to date. The reason for the extension was to get at this part, the current ongoing studies. There's an update in the wings from us, the commission staff for the water resource protection plan update. It's supposed to be happening, it was supposed to happen this year, but it looks like it's gonna be 2015. There were evapotranspiration studies done by UH, uh, updated recharge studies in, that were currently uh, ongoing. Um, we also, uh, as staff, the, to the commission, we contracted a review of water uh, use and water levels and try to identify trends. I'll get into that a little bit later. And then the USGS, um, we contracted uh, with to look at an isotope study to try define, well, how's the water moving around from the high level in the basal? A little bit more on that later. And there's also a 3D numerical model that's been ongoing really since, uh, I, I believe it's 1999 with the USGS as well. Um, and the petition talks a little bit about that too. So with that, when a petition comes in, there are eight criteria that the, com the commission shall consider. Okay, they're not limited. The commission is not limited to these, but it's a minimum and you should consider. It doesn't mean an automatic designation if one is met or no designation if nothing is met. It's just something that they, the commission must consider. Uh, the major one is the 90% of sustainable yield, whether existing and author, there's this term authorized plan use, but we, we're gonna use projected future use uh, in this analysis here to get at this 90%, this first. Uh, the next one is actual uh, water quality degradation as determined by the Department of Health. Unfortunately, we don't have a director right now in the transition to the new administration, um, but a uh, response from them is forthcoming. Um, thirdly, whether diminishing, um, um, it, where there's excessive declining water levels. I'll get into that a little bit later. It's something that we found out may be a concern. Uh, fourth, whether that the, the rate, time, spatial patterns of the pumping is basically endangering the optimum development of the, of the aquifer um, and the risk being encroachment of salt water. Things will be salting up and then we can't drink salt water, yes? Fifth, um, actually if chloride contents in the wells are increasing to levels which is reducing the utility under uh, existing uses if there's excessive preventable waste occurring, uh, if there are serious disputes respecting the use of groundwater, and lastly, if there are any uh, federal, state, or county approvals which would result in the previous seven. So those are the eight criteria that the commission needs to consider. In the findings of fact, we briefly kind of touched upon it, but at this particular jo uh, point, we're not making any final uh, merits decision on all these criteria. We're just presenting facts today that we found over the past year. The petition itself, um, if you read through it um, and trying to digest it in the context of those eight criteria, what we felt um, and have presented over the past year is there are actually five of the eight criteria that the Commission shall consider that are raised and one is the sustainable yield and um, it's, uh, it's not adequate to address traditional and customary rights, um, whatever impacts of reduced uh, discharge to ankyline ponds in the ocean because of pumping, that's a concern. And then the projected water demands of the future are gonna exceed sustainable yield, that would be the 90% criteria again. And then rising sea level, um, and I, I believe also climate change is, is in there as well. Uh, declining rainfall is gonna impact the sustainable yield. So basically that first criteria about 90 percent we're going to hit um, we're going to exceed that we're going to meet that um, salt water encroachment this is in the Kahalu area specifically at the shaft I'll get into that a little bit later waste is occurring um, the use in Kona is two and a half times higher than other areas of the Big Island serious disputes uh, about what is the future pumping the cumulative effects on the national park resources and actually conceptual models of what's going on underground in the aquifer as part of the 3D model thing going on. 
Uh, and lastly, this is kind of a repeat potential projects. Um, that's that federal government, um, state, that kind of approval, which may result in the above. So that's kind of a summary of the petition from staff's perspective, and we still sticking to that. And I'm going to go through these actually as part of the, the submittal itself um, as, as follows, just so we can see some facts here. Okay. This is actually a little bit um, new simply because uh, this area is the aquifer system again. The sustainable yield currently is 38 million gallons per day. However, based upon the new recharge estimates, new studies, and so forth, the best estimates we have seem to indicate that the sustainable yield could go up to as high as 80 million gallons per day. Okay? Um, that's even with climate change. Okay? That's what the studies have said. It's just, you know, don't shoot the messenger. That, that's what these studies say. That's our best estimate, even with the last 30 years uh, and future climate change scenarios. Well, that sustainable yield is a fraction of these recharge studies, which um, the range there, these numbers come from these numbers, actually. There's 87 to 183 million gallons per day, which is getting into the ground just from precipitation over this area. That's not counting whatever flow is coming from other adjacent aquifer systems. This is how we account for things across the board. So we're just looking in this area. That's the water that we think is coming in. Given that and the concerns of the petition, when you're looking at the coastal discharge, there's a, that would translate to a range, which is basically subtracting sustainable yield. If you use, it, use or pump up to these numbers, a range of 49 to 145 million gallons per day. So you can see these numbers um, uh, exceed, you know, the minimum exceeds the minimum here, uh, the maximum far exceeds the maximum here. So what we're trying to point out here is that even if you pump all the way up to sustainable yield, there's going to be significant coastal dis discharge that continues. Okay? That's the first point. Now, as part of uh, our trend analysis report we have with a consultant and our continued uh, efforts at getting water use information, water level information, chloride information from all the users. There's 129 total wells in this aquifer system area. 39 are pumping. This graph is, I think, every, this is new for everyone because I think before, we, when we first started, we only had up into the, the mid-80s. We've kind of, we've added additional pumpage. Um, but historically, we've gotten a better picture from way back when. That's important because that produces trends. Currently, it's about 39% if you take the maximum um, average pumpage of uh, about 15 million gallons per day. So it's a little difficult to see, but it's this green line that averages out on a 12-month moving average. So you're always getting a, a full hydrologic year involved. It, it's evening out the dry times of the year and the wet times of the year. And the highest we had uh, just at the end of last year was 15 million gallons per day. Out of 38 is the sustainable yield, this red line, that's 39%. If you look here, um, actually the uh, pumpage began all the way back in uh, 1960. And uh, if you look at the trend of how things have gone from where we, it was very low, this is about the past 44 years, since 1971, the trend is about 341,000 gallons per year increase. That's a pretty consistent trend there. Um, I'm sure some of you are trying to do the math in your head. If you extrapolate this out, when do we hit this? Well, that would take about 67 years if we followed this trend. So again, that's just information. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but if it follows this trend, that's how long it would take to reach sustainable yield. Okay, that 15 is broken down into two components. Um, these green sources in the aquifer system area, the basal, it's a very thin lens, it's uh, brackish, but in some areas it has been historically good enough to drink, and particularly at the Kahalu shaft, although they have some salinity problems. But what I want to point out here is these circles show the relative um, quantities that are being pumped from all the pumping sources, those uh, 
uh, 30, 20, 39 sources. You can't see the real small ones, um, but the big one is this Kahalu shaft, okay? And that's the one that happens to be having some salinity problems, and it's in the southern portion of the aquifer. The high level um, are these six sources, okay? The total from the high level right now is six out of the 15. The total out of the basal is nine. So the basal is still supplying a significant amount of demand, um, both potable and non-potable. So that's what, what the status is today. Uh, in the petition, and this is from the water use, uh, water use and development plan. Um, well, let me take a step back. Having said this, we, I think we've established what the spatial distribution and the actual quantity of existing uses. So what is, what's going to happen in the future? Takes you to the next chart, which is uh, what, what's your crystal ball? What's going to happen in the future? The sustainable yield is this red line here. We've highlighted that. And all these bar graphs are uh, estimates uh, based on population growth out to 2025, um, county zoning, full build out, and then the county general plan, full build out using all um, what's in the county's general plan. And you can see it exceeds it, okay? Uh, the dark blue is ag and the hatched is urban, okay? Now, whether or not these actually come to fruition, that's something the commission has to consider and decide whether that's uh, probable, I guess. Um, but we do know that if you were to use the, the worst possible case, the general plan full build out, uh, who knows when that would happen, that would be 175 million gallons per day, okay, and that would serve a million people. Just to you know, get an idea, do you think you'd have as many people, I guess, as on the island of Oahu living just in this aquifer system area. Um, that's, you know, people can have their opinions on that. Okay. Um, this, okay, as part of the projected demands, came actually from the county in our consultation as part of the process. What do you guys think? And this was presented at um, the November uh, 19th meeting that we had on Oahu to give the county extra time to explain what they felt were the projected demands. And what they said um, was they felt authorized planned use was more related to commitments which have been made. And this is similar to what happened in the Iao designation um, uh, on the island of Maui where they, there was a listing of what are these commitments, what are these agreements. And they've, um, based on that, they were saying that um, they have commitments that will bring the future pumpage up to about 20 million gallons per day. Okay, this green line. Okay, sustainable yield is still up here in the red. Um, they also provided population growth at, um, um, extrapolations to try generate on a per capita basis what the demand might be too. So they have a range. Both seem to indicate by the year 2030 is about the time, you know, we're gonna hit uh, 20 at least you know, from population trends. Okay, that's a piece of information that staff has used. From testimony in our investigations, there's been additional um, quantities that I wanna highlight here for you. And first is the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, which is a little bit different uh, character in terms of zoning and so forth. And their projected full build out, and by the way, there's part of the testimony that came in recently was a request for re reservation. Uh, that turns out to be a, about three and a half million gallons per day. So what we're saying is, add that. There may be some double counting in commitments here, and there actually is, but let's take the worst case scenario. So that's three and a half million gallons per day. Now the state water projects plan, which is part of the Hawaii water plan, and this is from 2003, uh, listed projects that we're going to tally up to about 5 million gallons per day. So if you take that and add it to what the county has as far as commitments uh, and, and these additional demands from these two entities yeah, in the Keaho aquifer system, we're going to come up to about 28, 28 and a half million gallons per day by the year to, uh, 2030. Now this box, so to speak, this between 23 and uh, 28 because we really don't know when, the, when these are, this is full build out. This may happen even further into the future beyond 
2030, but we're going to be conservative and say it's all, everyone's going to have all the money they need. They're going to develop right away and get all their approvals. So what we've done in the findings, okay, the total demand here is on the, is on the bottom. That box, that 23 to 28, is uh, exemplified right here. This one right here. This is the same as that. Okay. This is the total aquifer, and so this is what we've envisioned the trends will be out into the 2030 time period. Okay. Uh, these are the basal wells. What the county is planning, what, because of the uh, salinity problems they're having at Kahalu Shaft, is not really increasing the pumpage um, beyond this. So actually, we should show this maybe a, a decreasing line. That's one of the things. Again, this is a preliminary findings. This may be decreasing. I think it will be because they're going to be shifting the pumpage from the basal aquifer to the high level. And you can see the high level has been, again, you know, average of six as opposed to nine. And this is where it's headed for the high level. But of course, it's important where these high level wells are. If they're all right above the park, not as good as if they're spread out uh, amongst the entire high level aquifer area. Now, Part of the sustainable, part of the petition and the concern is, well, that issue itself, where these wells are located, if it's all concentrated above the park, it's going to impact them. Part of the ongoing studies that we've completed because of this extension has been, well, how much of that high level is going to get down into the basal area? Uh, this is from some, uh, this particular is from Don Thomas. He drew this up, but he was drawing the flow lines, and I think this, we, in conjunction with the uh, Department of Health and their SWAT model, we have been in discussions with them too. Generally, I think most hydrologists would agree these flow lines are pretty safe to say that's, that's how the, the water is flowing in this area. Given that, that's a general, you know, this is a general trend, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is the map's gonna be reoriented slightly and that general trend is in this direction, okay? Now you have two areas here, which are above the park. The park is down here, okay? Um, this, is, this blue line depicts the basal portion. This red line depicts the high level portion of the water that is falling directly above these areas and then flowing Makai to the ocean. Okay, now these isotope studies um, helped us to come up with some numbers. Okay, preliminary again. This uh, subset of the entire aquifer area, we did our analysis on the staff level using the recharge of the USGS. What we came up with is the local, local recharge, that's just the water falling above here, in the high level is about 47 million gallons per day, uh, and the local recharge above the basal is about 8 million gallons per day. It's all a lot wetter. You can just look at this. It's green up here and lava field down here. So, makes sense. Now, the isotope studies looking at the composition of the water, um, and that was explained that these site investigations back in September and um, further from staff in the, uh, investigations came up with 30% um, of the total Q, that's the quantity of water in this basal area, is from this, this eight, okay? If you think about that a little bit, 30% of the total amount of water in this bathtub, okay, is about 8 million gallons per day, local precipitation. Well then, if you have these two numbers, what you can figure out is that then the total Q, yeah, 8 is basically one-third of the total, which is 26, okay? Now, having that in mind, the isotope studies, both from FACRO and the USGS, came up, uh, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, the isotope study said 50% of the local recharge from the high level is part of this total Q, is part of the, what's going into this bathtub. So this 50%, okay, relates to this 26%, okay? That's the total Q in the here. 50, oh, sorry, 50% 50 of that, okay, is coming from the high level, okay? What that means, yeah, there it is. That's the portion that's overflowing. The overflow is about 13 million gallons per day. So 13 out of 47 million gallons per day is 
So roughly a quarter of what you pump up here is going to decrease down in this area. So the issue was before, uh, all of it, 100% of what you pump is going to impact down by the coast. Um, or zero, because there's evidence of fresh water going below uh, in this area due to uh, a couple deep monitor wells, which we've heard before, that are going through the salt water and finding fresh water under pressure deep below the basal aquifer. So it's neither extreme, it's neither zero, it's neither 100%. Uh, what the isotope studies seem to indicate is about a quarter of the high level water that you pump is going to uh, decrease to the local area here at the park. Okay, so right. that. Is it a quarter of what you pump or a quarter of the total recharge? Repeat the question, bro. Um, a total, a, well, it's a total of the recharge, but. The recharge, right. Which is but, much more than the sustainable yield. Yes. Can you repeat the question for the audience? Okay. The question was this 28% is it, um, uh, is this of the recharge or the pumpage? Okay. Well, it is, um, it is 28% um, of the recharge. Recharge. Right. But that means if you're pumping, you're, you're pumping that recharge. So if you have one of that recharge, then a quarter of it is going to the basal, or excuse me, let me take it back. If you pump, yeah, one quarter of that recharge would have gone to the basal. The other uh, three fourths would, are, is going somewhere else. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean. So yeah, it is pumpage. It is pumpage as well. It's both. It's both recharge and pumpage. Yeah, it's pumpage, but the total recharge is much, much greater than the sustainable yield. So oh, yes. you have a whole lot more coming down. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. So that's um, what I wanted to describe in terms of the issues surrounding the interaction between the high level and the, the basal. What I'm going to do here is switch to... Oh, this is the findings of fact itself. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, now, that, that one quarter or 28% of the local recharge that's going in actually helps, it kind of makes sense of what we're finding as well. Um, this is an... Yeah, one more question. You guys get all in your answers. When you guys think for all it is? I like, you know what I mean? You guys get one thing. Abel, I'm going to ask you to have some respect. Let him get through the presentation, okay? Because the, the commission members need this information in order to deliberate and make a decision. If you keep interrupting, we're not going to get to that point. Okay? So I'm just asking for your patience. Thank you. You better think about us too, yeah? Because okay. we come from far places, yeah? And I am homeless too, yeah? Okay. okay. Well, hello. Let us get through this, okay, Abel? Uh, thanks for your patience. Okay. Okay. Remember that. So the, the quarter uh, amount of water that's getting into the basal actually kind of makes sense given some of the um, other information that we found, both from finding perched aquifers. We found these things over the courses of year over the years. We have a. Um, uh, video camera too that goes down. We've been going down a lot of the wells and finding perched water that's going, coming into a number of the, the wells uh, in the high level. And that's kind of rearranged our thinking about that 100% going into the aquifer or 0% going into the basal aquifer. And it's, it's really a combination. And that's what this presents is the, the, the lava flows coming down and what's falling above, um, some of it's being short-circuited directly into the basal. <laughs> A lot of it may be getting under, and that's what we find with these deep monitor wells, a lot of fresh water deep. So that makes sense. Um, the one and new th finding as a result of these investigations, if I can get there, and it's a concern, and it speaks to uh, that's some of the deep monitor well data. Uh, you saw that. I updated that. Just bear with me is the water levels here. Okay, it's a little bit difficult to see at this scale, 
but there's a number of uh, wells that we've been monitoring um, in terms of water levels. One of the criteria is those excessive declining water levels. There's graphs attached. What I'm going to show here is actually uh, the trends. Okay, this wasn't really brought up in much detail on the petition, but as part of the investigation, it's a concern that we're raising as staff to you to consider. Um, this first chart here is the rainfall over the past, um, well, it's been quite a, quite a number of, of years. But since the, uh, I believe it's the 50s, we've had a declining trend, okay? Now these, these water levels are at all those selected sites we have. And what you will see is that there's been a decline here, okay, at all these high levels over the past 25 years. Um, we're only looking at this portion of the rainfall, though, okay? So what we're seeing here is also a result of what's been happening much further back in time. Rainfall has declined. Keep in mind, though, the recharge numbers that we have have already considered this decline, okay? So they've been worked into those numbers. Um, but what we're seeing here is these declining water levels here at uh, uh, Hualalai Deep Well. This is another one. Um, another one, 17%, 8%. Not much data there. 6% here, 10% 25 years, 9% in 25 years. If you take this, if you look at this as a whole, okay, water levels are declining, probably because of the decline in rainfall. However, because we've been finding this, these perched aquifers and water flowing into the wells, all of which in the high level were drilled before we had the Hawaii well construction standards, which were developed in 1997, which prevent you from the, having these interconnected um, issues. Um, there could be some, uh, some wastage of sort. You know, basically you're short circuiting. Uh, the worst case scenario is if you have our artesian, it's coming up from deep fresh water, it's coming up, and then it's getting into, uh, it's getting salt into the salty uh, basal lands, okay? And um, uh, the state itself is probably guilty of that more than any, anyone else in the Keopu deep monitor well, okay? Because we've discovered the deep fresh water. Once that confined layer was penetrated, and this is just open hole now, the water levels rose 20 feet. If you case that thing, it may rise even higher. But all that water that's coming up, which is for, for um, um, pretty fresh, and it's probably connected to the high level, is coming out and going into the salt water portions beneath the basal and the basal itself. So just from that monitor well alone, there's problems. But these high level wells are showing things too. And part of that may be part of the construction. We're not sure. That's where we're thinking there needs to be more investigation about this. But we think we could handle this um, through the well construction um, and uh, pumped installation tools and permitting that the commission already has in place here and throughout the rest of the state. So, and just to give one idea too, if you look at these numbers, we're talking about 10 to 20 percent in 25 years. That means we got time. We probably have one or two centuries before these water levels go all the way down, so we have time to uh, see if this is just rainfall. And this, is, of course, is assuming the rainfall stays low and we don't go in a wetter period, which the climate scenarios suggest it will happen. It will get, it'll get wetter in Kona. Right. Question? decreases in direct correlation to the decrease in rainfall? Is it a one-to-one -one ratio? Um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that analysis. If it's a one-to-one -one regression analysis and see what the relationships are. But, just looking at it, there is some, some relationship, whether it's 100% or something less. The audience can't hear, so if you can just oh. repeat the question real quick. Yeah, the question was, is there a direct correlation between um, the decrease in rainfall and these water levels? Uh, well, obviously, it does have some correlation. How much of that is from rainfall and how much of that is from uh, this interconnecting of aquifers? We don't know. We can't quantify right now without further investigation. Right. Can you go back to that? You want me to talk oh, about Okay, sorry. Good Just idea. For the benefit of the public so you can hear my question. Um, can you go back to that slide, Roy, um, with uh, authorized plan use or future oh, use? Yeah, sure. <coughs> this one? No. Oh. Um, the other projection that you had uh, where you said a million people living in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
that one. There we go. Yeah, the dynamic. Okay. Okay, so just so I'm clear in understanding this. So that bar graph on the right hand side, full plan build out. So although you, I mean, a million people in Kiowa Aquifer doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon, that's in a plan for a million people to be. According to their, yeah, their general According plan. to an approved plan. Uh, the general plan. General plan. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Could you also clarify that it's not authorized? I mean, you can repeat the question. Okay, okay. Um, that it's not authorized. Um, I guess that, that is the question, and one that has to be grappled with, with the commission, because it, the authorized plan use has been uh, dealt with in different ways. And we actually have another, um, we have other thoughts about that. Um, and if I may just a little bit get into there to help answer the question. Uh, the community development plan is another portion of the you know, authorized plan use, so it's just not the general plan. And part of community development plans, at least in the past, at the time when the code was passed, on Oahu anyway, um, they identified projects. Okay. Now they've moved away from that identified projects, which you can quantify amounts, and gotten to more... Uh, general, general holistic ideas. I think in Keho is those uh, TOD, I think you, if you recall the traffic oriented development areas, kind of hard to uh, glean out numbers from just those kinds of concepts as opposed to individual projects. So again, like in the EL uh, situation and on Lanai, in those designation, projects were listed. So you could come up with these numbers that were more probable and um, I think the county tried to do that and we've added to that from other pieces of information to get this range of what we think is probably 23 to 28, which is um, uh, more, I guess, authorized. But again, it's up to the commission to decide what they think is. is. So there's been a change in the past from project by project to more general things. I think it's causing some problems with getting at these numbers. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Getting into a few things in the submittal itself. Um, I think we've touched upon um, most issues with the sustainable yield. Uh, we've looked at uh, the excessive waste. We talked about the well portion, the Hawaii Department of Water Supply, um, and their portion, and what they have reported as, as terms of customers is identified. Um, question. Yeah, I, I have a, a question regarding uh, regarding waste. Um, is uh, uh, re unused reclaimable water uh, considered waste? I know there was some discussion about that at the Water We Use conference a few weeks ago. Uh, is unused wastewater considered waste? Well, I don't think we've ever come up with that as a, a definitive statement. At least no commission has, has uh, come up with that position. Um, it's water that could be reused. It's a resource. But we're only talking about the natural groundwater itself. Um, and again, part of these, and if I may add to that, even with groundwater that's used, we're, we're talking about it in this situation as if it's 100% consumed, it's all going out the pipe. Now, and that would be the wastewater you say, hey, that's a, that's, that's a waste, it's all going out the pipe into the ocean. Well, a lot of this is actually being used through irrigation, it's going to cesspools and so forth. So a lot of that water is going back into the ground. So what we're talking about in uses here are, are conservative, they're, they're conservative, we're saying, hey, it's, it's all disappearing, when in reality it's not. And that has implications on the salinity problems, um, or issues, rather, that the park is concerned about. Okay. okay. All right. So, well, and, and let me take a step back. The salinity issue, since we're talking about that, is really only defined, again, in the Kahalu area. And they're trying to get off the shaft. I think you saw that at the site investigation. They're going to be concentrating, uh, moving to the high level, although... Um, 
let's see if I can show it again, that map. What we're trying to t say is you need to spread out that high level to the south. Okay, and I don't, oh, yeah. question. Uh, yeah, I, uh, another question regarding the uh, um, uh, switch over from uh, the, the uh, Kalalu shafts, which are very salty, to the high level. Um, I understand the concept of trying to spread out the pumping and how essential that is. The, the high level uh, wells, a lot, a lot of the high level wells that, we, that we've been told about are uh, being uh, drilled and um, put into production by private uh, developers, specifically to add new source for uh, projects that are coming online in the future. There's, I'm wondering how that works with Board of Water Supply, which has an imperative to spread out the pumping using high level wells to uh, s spread out and replace the uh, basal water from Kahalu, Kahalu uh, shaft and other sources that are salting up how that works when the new water that's being uh, created is not being created by Board of Water Supply, but by private entities who are doing it. Uh, and, you know, since they're creating it, have a right to do it uh, for their own projects. It seems to create a bit of a uh, dichotomy. So will that water be available for the existing users whose older basal sources are salting up, or will they have to maintain on the salted up basal sources while the new development gets the uh, high level uh, water being created by private developers? Okay. Um, well, that, that's an interesting question and probably better answered by the county, but if I may, the two, the two tools I think that the county has uh, in their toolkit yeah, to control how that water is developed is one, of course, whatever agreements they have and how it works into their infrastructure to make the whole thing work, which they know better than, than we do. Um, but secondly, maybe more importantly, is in the water use and development plan, remember it's, it's uh, uh, development plans and water use. How are you gonna connect the two? So, um, and it's not in the, the present water use and development plan, but where is the, the growth directed? Is it gonna go south? Yeah, um, and that's the vehicle as part of the Hawaii Water Plan, which integrates with the state, with the Water Resource Protection Plan, says this is how much is there. You have the state water projects plan, which says this is how much the state's gonna use. You have an ag plan and so forth, and integrating all of these together is kind of the place to, to get at that. What I think staff would like to do is to, at some point, not now because it's not there, but in the future, be able to approve uh, well construction permits based upon, hey, this is, you know, this, this isn't according to the water use and development plan. It, it is, you know, in that plan, and then go that route. We're not there yet, but that's one way of, of getting at it. So that's a, a second tool I think the county has. Next up, I'm about, and isn't the water use development plan being updated uh, at this point? <laughs> that Can you hear that? Or? Yeah, I want to know. I think we heard the water use development plan is being updated, and they're consulting with you. And the new revision is in early 2015. Uh, yeah, that is correct. I'm not uh, that familiar with all the details. I think it's more on the the demand side, but uh, certainly I think that would be one thing that, through this uh, petition anyway, to impress upon and to answer and give some direction. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So um, as far as excessive waste, we didn't really find that, although high, it's excessive as far as per capita use based on the numbers they provided, which does have some integration of com commercial, has some NELHA, um, you've seen the operations down there. So the numbers are high, but it is kind of skewed because of the big users as opposed to the small guys. Uh, the serious disputes, um, I guess, get into the conceptual model, which with new information, it seems like it's kind of dovetailing towards uh, 
something new. We're still waiting on the, the 3D model from the USGS. They're still uh, working on that. And I think, as it's uh, said in the submittal here, um, they're not looking to have that finished until the end of next year. So um, the conceptual model, serious dispute is kind of still going on, though I think they're adjusting things because of what we're finding out. Um, the other is about the impacts to the uh, near shore biota and the traditional and customary practices. Um, from the findings, in a nutshell, what we're finding from local biologists, aquatic resources within the department is that um, the one um, species that's been brought up in the petition that's at risk because of salinity is the, the damselfly. All the other native species, um, termite, urohaline is something I learned, uh, but they, they can adapt to a wide range of salinities, which um, occurs along the coast with the tidals, tidal fluctuations, and so forth, um, and they can adapt. And so it's the damselfly. But that's probably a good segue into the traditional customary practice issue. Um, we don't see that there's this nexus with the damselfly and traditional customary um, uh, practices, which is part of the pro public trust. Yeah. Um, Question? Yeah. I was wondering whether it, it, uh, talking about um, uh, species habitat uh, related to uh, cultural use, any work was done regarding the uh, native Hawaiian yellow-faced uh, honeybee, which um, are, I'm a beekeeper, so I'm a little bit more aware of bees. And um, they're just about gone with the varroa mite. Uh, they're just about gone from every place in the state. And the only place I've ever seen them in quantity uh, is uh, at the Ankyaline uh, ponds down at the uh, park. And I just uh, was wondering whether you had uh, seen any work related to that. No, that's a, a new issue, I think, and no one's brought it up. Um, it's certainly one that we could look into uh, in a continued in, in, uh, extended investigation phase. Um, but so far, yeah, the only one is the, the damselfly, which Again, we don't see a nexus with the, the traditional and customary practices. Uh, the traditional and customary practices themselves, um, they do obviously occur at the park, but we also know that uh, one fish pond, the largest one, it's not allowed. They're not allowed to occur. It's, it's a protected wetland. So that seems kind of contrary to um, the issues that the park is raising. Protect traditional and customary, however, it's not allowed in some parts of the, the park. So if you want to save traditional and customary, allow it to happen. There's also the issue of maintaining the ponds, which have occurred, as you saw at some other developments, where they've taken out the invasive um, vegetation. But what many of these haven't been able to do is take out the invasive um, uh, fish, yeah, that seem to be in the, the major impact on things like the old Bayula in the Ankyline ponds. And part of that's because, and what we've learned, is that um, the, you know, the use of uh, like uh, rotenone uh, pesticide, which could, doesn't affect the opaiula, but would get rid of like the mosquito fish. That would have far greater impact on helping to restore that issue or the native species, as opposed to trying to control that by pumping wells. So, um, that's all I have to say on that, uh, in a nutshell. There's also legal arguments that have been made in the petition, but that, that'll be the addressed separately. We're not gonna address that in the scientific side of things. So that really, with the eight criteria summarized with the petition, um, staff is simply making the recommendation as given earlier about your three choices and uh, that staff's presentation. <laughs>